So we got uh, three weeks in now of our Letting Go of Christmas series, and hopefully this is something that has piqued some interest in you. Uh, it doesn't sound like a typical Advent series title to let go of Christmas, because of course, as uh, Sally Ann prayed, we usually want to hold tight to Christmas and what it means. But each week what I've been trying to do in this series, Letting Go, is uh, trying to push us to consider things that have nothing to do with Christmas, right? Like things that are creating a lot of noise around it, and not everything that I've talked about is necessarily bad. And it's okay to embrace the things that I've talked about, which we'll hit again this morning, but they're, they can easily get in the way of Christmas. And I know a lot of Christians who get upset because they say, well, look, nobody's celebrating the meaning of Christmas anymore, but a lot of Christians aren't either. And so this is a message for us, really. Uh, it's a message for those that are curious and wonder what Christmas is about and what we should hold to. So at the heart, this whole thing is an Advent series. And Advent is something that we do. We light these candles because it's, for us, a way to celebrate the bigger story. It's a way for us to understand and appreciate that Christ didn't just come randomly out of nowhere and just be like, oh, well, i got nothing better to do, so I'll just be born on earth. Like, that's not what happened. There, there was something that was a lot that was leading up to it and a lot still after. And so what Advent does is lets us see that bigger story because it celebrates his first arrival because Advent comes from the Latin word adventus, which means first or means coming or arrival. And so we celebrate the first time that he showed up but also the unfulfilled part of the promise that he was going to come back. So there, again, something very supernatural about what we believe at Christmas time, but it's not just baby Jesus in a manger. And you do a huge disservice to Jesus Christ, the one this whole holiday is supposed to be about, if you just make it about baby Jesus. And you forget that baby Jesus is also creator God. Like, it's really easy to make Jesus as somebody you, you don't need to worry about, you don't need to worship, you don't need to take seriously if he's just baby Jesus. If you forget that baby Jesus is Revelation 19 Jesus, coming back as conquering King Jesus. Like, if you don't put the story in a bigger context, you're going to miss the point. And that's, I think, what Advent helps us do. And that's how Jesus saw his story. So, what we're doing for Advent is we're hitting themes, right? So we've got five candles, four candles technically for Advent Sundays, and then one as we get together on Christmas Eve and celebrate. But the first one, we looked at hope. And hope, we focused on that Isaiah 9 passage. And it's a very famous Christmas passage because it looks forward hundreds of years ahead of time, 700 years ahead of time, in fact, to when this Messiah would come. And he gives a title to this Messiah. And so we looked at that hope, and we looked at what was involved in that hope for those people for hundreds of years not hearing. And then last Sunday, we looked at peace, and peace was what was promised. That's what the announcement in Luke chapter 2 was all about. We'll read that in a second. But it's the whole point and purpose of Jesus, not to just have peace from God, but to have peace with him. That's the cornerstone of the Christmas story. And again, it's much more compelling if you think about the full story, the full scope of Creator God coming and doing these things and offering these things. So that's where we were last week, and we talked specifically again about the financial stuff and, the, and all the buying and everything that, that doesn't bring a lot of peace. And then today, we look at one that can be also a little bit tougher today. It can be tough to have hope today. It can be tough to have peace today. But in a lot of ways, for a lot of people, I know it can help be tough to have joy. Joy is a hard one right now because the life for most people right now, and I know globally, but even particularly in our own church family. I got up here and asked last Sunday for prayer for my own family and for our leaders because we've been going through a lot. And thank you for your prayers, by the way. People that have been checking in, Bear is fine. Uh, he did, for those of you who don't know, he had, we had taken to the hospital and we thought some stuff was going on, but it was all clear and that was all good. But again, these things had to be true whether or not everything was going to be okay. And I was thinking about this stuff. Like, you know, can I lean into the Prince of Peace. I just lit the candle of peace last Sunday, and it's like, here's my wife not even at church. My son's not at church because they're in the hospital. So but these things have to land in real life for us, and whether or not things are good and whether or not things are joyful, because I know a lot of people right now in our church, it's the reason I stood up here and asked for prayer for our church last Sunday, is because a lot of people are hurting desperately and deeply right now in this church. And we need to like, be able to understand that we can still have joy even when our lives are falling apart. I mean, that's really... That's where the rubber meets the road. And these things, again, they have to be tangible in our lives. And so that's the stuff I want to talk about. Is this what's offered to us this season? 
And if we get lost in the decorations, which I love, don't get me wrong, if we get lost in the things of Christmas, we're going to lose the meaning of Christmas. And what ends up happening when we do that is this first question from last su- or two Sundays ago, is we end up getting to a place where we're losing the meaning. Go ahead, next slide. We're losing the meaning because Christmas is an idol that's destroying Christmas, which is a weird thing to say. It's a weird idea to wrap your head around, but what I, was, what I meant by that is if we give all of our attention to the, the trappings and the trimmings of Christmas, and we focus on the details of Christmas so much that we completely lose the real meaning, right? The details overcome the meaning. Like that, that's when you get to a point where now you're worshiping Christmas instead of Christ. That's where I started off, and I really want to challenge you with that. Again, are you considering the real meaning this Christmas of what it means? Are you falling into that trap of just chasing all the Christmas stuff. Because I know for myself, especially when you got younger kids, it's very, very easy to worship Christmas instead of Christ because we set these expectations that just aren't real. They're just not real, right? But it's like, and if they don't happen, if we don't see it that way, if it's not done that way, then Christmas was ruined. And it's like, what well, is it? Does it really lose the meaning? So these are things that I have personally wrestled with. And so I wanted to share some of the verses that we've hit to try to address some of these things. So in Luke 24, you have the road to Emmaus encounter. Now, if you're not familiar with the story, what happens in this scene here is it's just post-resurrection. And this is the reality. This is like the beauty, I think, of the Bible. Is it just, it's so awkward and painful. It doesn't, like, it doesn't try to like, skim over stuff. It just lets you sit there with the awkwardness. Here's these two disciples. Their Messiah, Jesus, has just been crucified. I mean, he's dead. All their hope is gone. They just wasted maybe three years of their life by like, following this guy around, and they don't know what to do. So Jesus walks up next to them, asks them what's going on, and what he does is he puts his story in the context of the greater story that it fits in. And again, that's Advent. So he clarifies for them, look guys, my birth and my life, my death, my burial, resurrection, all these things that we tell them, all this is in the context of the greater story from Genesis to Revelation. And what I mean by that is what Luke records in chapter 24. Jesus says to them, then, Beginning with Moses, so he's going all the way back to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, which is like a way of saying the Old Testament, Jesus interpreted them, or interpreted for them, the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So what did Jesus do? How did he help them understand his story? Well, he basically told them the story of the Bible. And that's a much more compelling story than just baby Jesus. Because just baby Jesus doesn't matter unless baby Jesus is creator God, unless baby Jesus gives his life and it leads ultimately to the cross, right? There's a heaviness to the Christmas story. So for Jesus, he understood that there was an eternal weight. And this is the part, again, that we need to, if we're not careful, I've gotten myself in trouble before because I focused too much on the death of Jesus during Christmas. And somebody just said they just didn't want to hear that. I said, well, I mean, that's like, that's the whole story. Right? That's like, that, that's not watching the end of a movie. That's just saying, well, I just want the beginning, or I just want this middle part. It's like, well, you have to, what's the whole story? Right? And so for Jesus, again, there's a weight of it. It's eternity, it's heaven, it's hell, the gift of God saying, look, I want you to have eternal life. Like, so that's, again, the bigger story, the bigger implications of that story, and that's what Jesus is trying to do for his disciples here. So that's one place we were. Then we read, uh, on, again, that first Sunday, one of the most famous Christmas passages for good reason. Again, 700 years before Jesus. Yeah, uh, the prophet Isaiah would pen these words. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. This is why there was so much hype around Jesus. They were looking for a dude that they, like the government was going to be on his shoulders. He was going to wipe out Rome. So they were really anticipating this kind of a savior. And then these words after really drove it home for him. He will be named Wonderful Counselor. This Messiah will be named Mighty God. He will be named Eternal Father. Those are some pretty big titles there. But then ultimately, Prince of Peace. This is who the Messiah would be. And again, much more compelling story to think that when Jesus came, this is who he claimed to be. And he's picking up these titles in his ministry that's recorded by his disciples. And so, again, the greater story of who the Messiah would be. And so as the story unfolds, this is what Jesus would say. And this is what Jesus would be. So in Luke chapter 2, the Christmas verse. If you're going to read the Christmas story this year, it's going to be in Luke chapter 2. And the announcement of the birth of Jesus is, comes across like this. You have the angels in the sky and the you know, scenery that we're all familiar with, perhaps. It says, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth 
the people he favors. So peace on earth, the people he favors, right? It's, it, this is one of the most famous verses with the Christmas story, but it's easy to overlook that he is the Prince of Peace, and he's coming to offer peace on earth. So when Jesus gets older, when he's preparing his guys for when he's going to be gone, and he's preparing them for a lot of suffering, because if you read the New Testament, you're going to see the New Testament disciples and Christians suffered greatly. And so in John chapter 14, verse 27, he's trying to prepare his disciples for that difficulty. And he says, look, in light of what you're about to face, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. Well, why? Because there's going to be troubling times ahead. You read the writings of the Apostle Paul, man, that dude suffered greatly. He was fearful. The apostles, the disciples, I mean, these, these guys, they suffered greatly. And it was difficult and unfair. And Jesus understood. He, he, uh, he felt it all. He suffered. He suffered loss of ones that he loved. He'd been betrayed by the people he trusted and loved. I mean, he felt it all. And he said, guys, I just want you to be aware. In light of all that, I leave you my peace. And again, that's why we celebrate him as a prince of peace. So it's peace with or from God through Jesus, but also peace with God in Romans 5, 1. Listen to this. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not just peace with, with God, right? That's, that's, that's the justification part. That's being made right with God. That's the heaven and hell stuff. But also he cares enough to give you his peace. So there's these, these two things that are promised, and that's, again, where I was last Sunday. And then this week as we move into joy, um, I want you to think about the where we were last Sunday and uh, the drive to buy things. So the question I asked about letting go of Christmas, one was, is Christmas an idol that's destroying Christmas? And last Sunday were, was, can gifts get in the way of the real gift? That was my question from last Sunday, and I want to say, obviously, yes. That seems like a softball question in church, but I want to say, yes, it can. And what I shared with you last weekend is something that can rob the Christmas season of joy. <clears throat> I watched so many videos, and I used to think it was funny. Of like people recording their kids when they open their presents and like they they flip out because the kids don't get what they want, right? And at first I was like, oh man, that's funny. But then I was like, why are you recording this? Why are you putting this online? And two, man, like how? Why are those kids acting like that? So there's always questions that go through my head. But like that's what's happened. We build Christmas up to be nothing more than just getting gifts. Why wouldn't they act that way, right? We set them up for that. We can point a finger at those kids and that's how slow they are. But they've been set up to think that that's what Christmas is about. But when they open that thing up, they should get exactly what they want. And if they don't, well, man, watch out. And that just that sucks the joy right out of the season, you know, when we have it and we follow that path. And so I wanted you to understand clearly, factually, last week that, yes, gifts can rob the season, right? They can totally rob the season. So statistically speaking, most people in their poll last year, when people were polled, they were asked, how much do you think you're going to spend on Christmas? Average person thinks about 850 bucks. It's like, you know, is it a big number, a small number? I don't know. I don't know what your budget is. But in reality, retailers know, based on evidence from last Christmas season, between November and December, the average American is going to spend about $4,300 on Christmas things. So we say, we think, oh, yeah, it's not about eight fifty or so on gifts. And we, we, like, completely forget all the dynamics of Christmas that, like, we can get sucked into. And so retailers know that we're going to spend, and they project this year that we're going to spend about $4,300 per person on Christmas stuff in two, in two months. Now, the sad thing is, and this is where the, the peace last Sunday gets sucked out as well, is the joy that we're talking about today, is 75% of Americans are going to put that $4,300 on a credit card. And one in four Americans are already in debt up to their eyeballs and paying off last Christmas still. One in four Americans are paying off last Christmas, this Christmas. And if the retailers are right, on average, they're going to just put $4,300 more dollars on the credit card. And I don't think that that's what the Prince of Peace was thinking for us when he said, I bring you my peace and I want you to have my joy. And I don't think that's what the Prince of Peace that's in Isaiah listed. I don't think that's what he thinks when he thinks of his birthday. So go to the next one. I don't think that's what the Prince of Peace is dealing with. Right? That right there. He is the Prince of Peace. I doubt the Prince of Peace wants us doing that kind of stuff during Christmas. I don't think the Prince of Peace wants us worshiping Christmas instead of Christ. I don't think the one that came that was mentioned in Luke 2 that says he's going to bring peace into the world, right? 
I don't think, again, that's what is the vision of the Christmas story. What we often celebrate and think of as Christmas. Again, it has nothing to do with Jesus, a lot of stuff. Not that it's all bad, but I don't think that that's what he had in mind. So when he said, here I am bringing peace on earth, and we too, I don't think that that's what he's looking at. And he gives us peace with God and peace from God. So in John 14, 27, again, he gives us his peace. But Romans 5, 1, he gives us peace with God. Like, I don't think that that's what he's thinking of, is what we've been given in the Christmas season. And I want to over, overemphasize, perhaps, I'm not saying all these things are bad. I'm just saying that we need to really check our hearts this Christmas season. Because it's really easy to point the finger at everybody else and say, oh, they forgot all about the meaning of the season. And yet we are doing the very same thing. We are just doing it in a little bit better looking way. Right? And so that's a personal question that I've had to ask myself as well. Can I do all these things but put a limit on them in a way that I'm not worshiping a holiday? That's a good question for us to think about. Let's distill it down to what it actually means and really be able to celebrate something this year. So back to our question to consider, though, for this series. That's just a quick recap. Our question this series, next one, is that we want to ask ourselves, how do you need to let go of Christmas this year? Very personal question for you because I want you to wrestle with this. Like, really, what is it that you built up over the years? What was it given to you that maybe you need to pause and have the freedom to say, well, no, I don't, I don't know that that's really the best to celebrate Christmas that way. I think maybe there's something I can do differently. And this week, our third question is, is Christmas giving bad? So that seems like a dumb question. I've basically been trying to give you a dumb question to consider every week and then trying to show you why maybe it's not so dumb. But is Christmas giving bad? Is there a, is there a scenario where this could be seen as a negative thing? Right? So I want to say off the bat, like right off the top, no, Christmas giving is not bad. But I do have a question for you, though. I wonder why, and I'd like you to think just to yourself as well, why is it that generosity all year long seems to kind of be like fledgling, and then right at the end of the season, it takes off? Why is it after Black Friday in Digital Monday or whatever it's called, Cyber Monday, there's Giving Tuesday? Why is that? Now, if I were to come up with, like, a giving day, I'd have giving Thursday before Black Friday. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wouldn't wait until everybody emptied their accounts on those two days and be like, now that nothing's left, can you give us some money? No, I'd try to get in, like, a week before. But why is it that there's this, this rise? Why is it that food banks and things like that get so much at the end of the year, but not during the rest of the year? It's why when we do, Deb actually suggested, Deb's over here on our, our, worship, our missions team, wow, our mission team, yeah, I had worship team in my head and I couldn't get rid of it. So she's on our mission team and she suggested to me one time, hey, that was cool that we did the food drive. And she suggested, let's get some food in here for our fasting service. And then she said, but you know what? When we do our other two, because we do three a year, kind of evenly spaced, we'll fast, we'll pray together as a church. She said, you know, in the spring and summer, our food banks, are, right, their, their shelves are running pretty empty. So it would be cool if like, while we're denying ourselves and we can continue to want to do things for our community, let's make sure we continue to collect food because they're going to need it. And then as I talk to food banks, they're like, yeah, we don't really have a lot, but it gets pretty thin the rest of the year. So my question is, why is that? Why is everybody so focused? I know it's a season of giving, but why? Why is it just a season of giving? Why aren't we consistently generous? That's what I want you to wrestle with this morning. I really want you to think, maybe you personally, but just generally, like, how, how am I thinking about generosity is it just a seasonal thing? Is it just a guilt thing? That's why we started with that call to worship this morning. Like, do you just give out of, like, seasonal guilt? Do you just guilt, you know, give because you feel bad or something like that? Or maybe even for the pride, right? Because it's like a little prideful thing for you to do. Like, is Christmas getting bad? No. But it certainly needs to be investigated, I think, and thought about a little bit deeper. A little bit deeper. And that's what I want to do together this morning because I think that, the baseline, what I'd love to just have us understand, is that Jesus, next slide, Jesus wants us to be generous because he's generous. Jesus expects us, I want you to hear that, if you're a follower or not today, if you're exploring or if you're all in, whatever, Jesus expects us to be generous because he's generous. Like, that's the bar for Christians. And that's all the time. That's all the time, right? And it, it's not about, hear me out this morning, being generous is not about the amount that you give. 
There's people here that are wildly generous in ways that I never, ever could be. I can't afford. They can be generous with more than I make in like half a year, right? It's like they're just able to do that. And that's cool. God's blessed them that way. But he expects us to be generous with what we have because we're reflecting him. And this right here, too. This is something I was thinking about all week long. We get to share the joy we have by reflecting the Savior we belong to. So whether or not you know Jesus as your Savior today, I want you to know that this is the bar. This is the goal. Because of who I have in Jesus Christ, because He's my Savior, because He's so generous with me, I want to reflect that into the world all the time. And if you're a follower of Christ, that's where you should be as well. And so I want to stick this question today in that context of the bigger question. I just don't want us to lose sight of where we are in the series of what you need to let go of personally this Christmas. So again, quick recap before we jump into this question. It might be that image of Christmas that you painted for yourself that could never ever live up to the hype that you built up. Right? Or maybe the pain that's associated with Christmas. It's like maybe there's some of those kinds of things that you've made Christmas about. And maybe you need to let go of that this year. Maybe it's that urge to just buy, 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 and spend every dollar you have to try to keep up or impress or satisfy or whatever the thing might be. Like maybe that is something you need to let go of. And then this week again. Maybe it's the idea that your generosity is only one time a year. Maybe it's the idea that generosity is just something you have to do every now and then. And I'd love for you to see, again, whether you know Christ or not today, I would love for you to understand by the time you leave today that, no, this is just who we are. As followers of Jesus, we need to be different. The world, man, the world's so messed up. My goodness, people like, they don't have to have any hope, any joy, any peace, nothing. And it's like, what if we were a community that people got to see that in? That's the call. That's always been the call for Jesus. Like, show my light. Like Brittany said earlier, show my light. So again, our question, is Christmas getting bad? So no, just to reiterate, no. As I said, it just shouldn't be a one-time deal. So to explore this question, I want to share some stories this morning out of my own life and share some stories that I've learned from other people. But I want to do that in a context of a passage that's really well-known for financial generosity. Now, usually... This passage is used by pastors to browbeat their people to give more money. That's not what this passage is about, though. Because it's ironic that a lot of times this passage gets used in that way, but we have an incredibly financially generous church. I mean, it, it blows me away how generous people are here. Whether we have some need, people are just like, bam, let us meet that. Like, let us do that. Let us give to that cause in this community. Like, let's rally around that. Like, you guys, it, it just you blow me away constantly with your generosity. And it lives this out. So I love, I'm preaching to a crowd that I'm literally watching do this, being financially generous, whether it's tithing of the church, whether it's like a mission thing, whether it's an outreach thing our youth group is doing. It doesn't matter. Like, I love watching how generous you guys are and it allows us to do so many cool things because you're generous. So thumbs up. So this passage is not browbeating anybody this morning. It's actually a celebration of where, what I'm already seeing in our church. Okay? And if you're not on board, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll guilt you into it. All right? So, so 2 Corinthians 9. And again, this is your life. I'm not talking about our church. I'm talking about your life. Okay? Um, which, of course, affects our church. But I'm talking about you in general day to day. So 2 Corinthians 9, the context of this passage is this. The Apostle Paul has uh, has tried to make some connections. So this is early Christianity. Remember, this is ancient Christianity. This is 2,000 years ago. People don't just take things for granted at this time. They don't know anything at this time. So the Apostle Paul is going around to all these churches and saying, hey, now that you're a new believer, 2 Corinthians 5, he says, now that you're a follower of Jesus, you're a new creation. So your life has to look different now. And this is what it looks like. That's pretty much what the New Testament is. That you're a follower of Jesus now, and this is how it affects your life. And so he's writing to these Christians because they said that they'll financially support Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. So Paul has realized that they've not done this. So Paul is gently reminding them that they've not followed through. He's saying, hey, you told them that you would help them out, and you haven't. So he is lighting a little bit of fire under them to say, you need to follow through this. The good news is, Romans 15 shows us that they do. Like, they actually, they come through, they do what they're doing, but Paul's like, look, 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 I just want you to remember, as followers of Jesus, your generosity is important. It's part of who you are now. And he also says, hey, I don't want to make it awkward, but I already told them you were going to give this gift. So I know that you don't want to look stupid, and I certainly don't want to look stupid, because I vouched for you guys, and I told them that you do this. So he's kind of like, he's putting it out there, right? 
So that's the context of this passage, and, this is, and then he makes this point almost over and over and over again. He says, the point of this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. This sets up the whole context for everything that he's about to say, and he's trying to teach them a spiritual lesson. He's saying, when you give, there's going to be a blessing that comes with that. And then he's going to flesh this out and what that looks like. And it's a pretty simple picture. You know, if you plant one seed, expect like one plant. If you plant a bunch, expect a bunch. And he's saying there's a spiritual blessing that's going to come with this. Not financial, that's health and wealth. Health and wealth will say, look, if you give financially, man, your God's going to bless you. He's just going to start pouring out your, like your bank account and it's just going to start spewing money all over you. That's health and wealth preaching and that's heresy. That's not what the Bible teaches, right? What he says is there will be a blessing though. And then he's going to flesh out what that looks like. And the key verse for this is verse 7. It's this one here. Each person should do as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. So that's key because there's a decision that's been made there to be generous. Again, early Christianity, they don't quite understand what this is all about. So he's saying to them, look, this is who you are now. You're a generous person, and you need to have a plan to do that. This is part of your life now. It's part of your budget now. Giving is just somebody or something that you do. And you're not going to do it reluctantly. You're not going to do it out of compulsion. So you shouldn't let Pastor Kyle or anybody else guilt you into it or force you into giving because God wants us to come from who you are. Again, you're a follower of Jesus now, so you're going to follow Him and you're going to let Him guide you. And that word cheerful there, so New Testament in Greek, hilaron. Cheerful. Yilaran. What does that mean? How else could you translate that? Well, cheerful was one. Merry is another. Or joyful. Now, talk about a Christmas verse, right? You've got, this is the attitude that we should have with our generosity, with our financial generosity. We should be blessing people not just one time a year, but again, it should be built in. It should be literally baked into my life because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. That's, that's a starting point, is what Paul says. And it should be done, again, not because somebody's forcing you, not because Pastor Kyle is appearing guilty into it, but just because it's like, okay, this is who I am now. I want to reflect that generosity. And again, to that point, we get to share the joy we have by reflecting the Savior we belong to. And it's not the size of the gift, but the sincerity and the spontaneity that matters for God. Just that you'd be willing to do that. Some people can afford to give a little bit. They can maybe do a $5 gift card for somebody. And they can maybe pay for somebody behind them in Dunkin' Donuts. Like, that's a cool gift to give somebody. And it's okay to ask. It's okay to say, hey, how much is the bill behind me? Like, oh, man, they bought $40. I can't do that today. But, oh, they just got a coffee? I can do that. Right? That's okay to do. And it's cool. It's such a blessing to do that to somebody. And then you can tell that, like, the person at the counter why you did that. I think it's a fun thing to do. And so, it doesn't matter how big it is, but again, am I, am I building this into who I am? And so he goes on, making this case, kind of repeating, again, the same, it's like a variation on a theme here. He says, God's able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. Basically, God's going to provide for you so you can do the good things he's got in store for you. That God's called you guys all, you ladies all, to do something somewhere that I can't do. Right? This half of the room is going to be a lot different places than this half of the room. And God has prepared you and called you to be an influence wherever that might be. Like, that's, that's what Christianity is supposed to look like. Ready, he plants us all wherever we are. And he's given you just enough so that you can do the work that he's called you to do. And Paul, is, he's calling to mind here a proverb. Proverbs 11.25 says this. A generous person will be enriched, and the one who gives a drink of water will receive water. Again, that's not health and wealth. That's not, you know, God's just going to make you rich. God's going to provide for you, and God's going to bless you to do the work that he's called you to do. And this is something, again, that uh, comes with a lot of intentionality. So I know for Brittany and I, like, I look at this and I know this to be true. God is going to make every grace overflow to you so that I can do what I need to do. So Brittany and I, the way we do our budget together is that the very first thing we budget for is our generosity. Like, because we understand, because we've had great people in our lives, great mentors in our lives that have showed us the importance of generosity, financial generosity, and I've seen a blessing in their lives from doing it. So when Brittany and I set out a budget, right up in the upper left-hand corner, what we start with is we carve out what we're going to be generous with. 
We don't wait till the end and like say, well, if I have any left, I'll be generous. We start with how we're going to be generous because we've learned that from other people. We learn that as a promise from God. And again, this is where some of my stories come. And it's, it's allowed us to come alongside people in a way that's really intentional. It's allowed us to come alongside friends or people that we hear of and we can go and we can get groceries. Or we can come alongside like we did. We got to bring our kids out with us and we got to drop off some groceries and a couple small gifts for a family, a single mom. It's like, why can we do that? Well, because God's given me just enough to do what I need to do so that he's going to pour back into me as I pour out to other people. And he's going to provide what I need to just do a little bit. Because in the scale of things, man, that's not a lot. Bringing some bags of things to people's houses. And I tell you this because I want you to know Pastor Kyle is doing this in his own life. I'm not asking you to do something that I'm willing to do. Like, we're doing this first, and this is a priority in our lives, and I'm seeing these promises come true in my life. And I want you to be able to experience something that other people have shown me to be true, and I've seen to be true in my own life. Because that's what following Jesus looks like. And it looks different for all of us. Right? Again, it's a difference of scale, and I understand that. Now, as it is written, he goes on, continuing the theme. As it is written, he distributed freely. So the question, well, shouldn't we? He gave to the poor, well, shouldn't we? And his righteousness endures forever. Verse 10. Now the one, God, who provides seed for the sower, that's us, and bread for food, will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. So God's going to provide for you again going to provide for you, going to bless you so that you can do what he's called you to do wherever he's called you to do it. And then there's going to be this echo into eternity. It's a harvest of righteousness. That means it's bigger than just being nice. That means when we get to go, Brittany and I, when we get to go and bless people like that, we don't just go to be nice. We say, hey, we just want to do this because, man, our church is blah, 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 or, you know, like, this, like we want to be able to share the love of Christ with you. Like, Brittany got to actually do that at the last place we want. Like, we just want you to see the love of Christ. And, and can we pray for you? So I didn't go there with my Bible and crack it open and be like, all right, let's start in John 1 and let me tell you about the path of salvation. Right? I'm not going to like, that. it's just like, like let's go and show the, love, show the love of Christ, tell them why we're doing that, and then let that door be open. Because now a relationship has been built. And when he got to pray over that family, and it was really cool. Our kids got to be a part of it. It's like, that for us is like, that's, that's a cool thing that we get to do. And then we got to share with our kids, hey, have you noticed how we're doing these things? This is why we're doing Like we're discipling our kids so that they pick up on what we're doing. Because if not, they're just like, I don't know, my parents are buying random stuff for these random people. I don't know what's going on, right? And it's just like, no, 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 let's, like, let's try to be intentional with what we're doing. And again, I'm not trying to just say, oh, look how great Kyle and Brittany are. I just want you to know that we're trying our best to do this as well. Like, we're trying to do this because it's been modeled for us, and this is what I see in God's Word. So then he goes on, next verse, he says, You will be rich in every way for all generosity which produces thanksgiving through us. So we should expect God's blessing. That's what I love about this section of, of Scripture. Don't feel bad about it. You should expect God's blessing when you're generous to other people. And Paul's picking up on an idea that's already there in Scripture from Proverbs. He says, again, he's like pulling an idea. Next slide. He says, a generous person will be blessed. So he shares his food with the poor. So we should, again, not health and wealth. We're not talking about, you know, you got a Lamborghini in the driveway the next morning. I'm just saying, you should expect God's blessing when you're generous with other people. I love that verse, and I love people that I've seen do this, because it's almost like God is saying, I found a person that I can use as a conduit to bless people. And don't you want to be one of those people? I mean, don't, like, I'll think about it. Wouldn't you love for God to identify you and say, that's a person I can trust. That's a person I can use as a conduit to really bless people's lives. I can use them to actually show tangible hope, tangible peace, tangible joy to because life is a mess sometimes, right? This all happens in the context of messiness in life. But wouldn't it be cool if so like, we could be, in our own brokenness, our own difficulties, we could still be a conduit in a little way for some of these bigger things that echo into eternity. Like, that's the kind of guy I want to be. That's the kind of husband and dad I want to be. That's the kind of person I want to be. I want to be a conduit. It's cool that we should expect the blessing them. Then verse 12, he goes on. He says, For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So, again, these acts of generosity are pointing people to the hope that is God. So there's a couple of side thoughts I want to give uh, this morning about generosity. One is don't deny generosity. I see this happen a lot. Like, 
somebody wants to do something nice for somebody else, and they're like, no, 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 and then, like, they just fight about it. So it was almost like God knew I was going to be doing this service today, because last Monday, I don't do my sermons here, because I can't focus and do anything, because I'm like a, I'm just, like, looking all over, and I can't get anything done, right? So I always go out in town, and I usually fill in my earbuds, so I can focus and just do my sermons at a restaurant somewhere, and this week, for whatever reason, I didn't have them in. And these two guys came in, like, for, like, from a power company or something like that. And they had breakfast. And at the end of breakfast, World War III broke out over who was going to pay for the bill. And me and everybody else in the restaurant got to listen in on this little conversation about who was going to pay for it. And the one guy, from what we all in the restaurant got our understanding of the situation, was that one guy had done something nice for the other guy. And so the other guy was like, hey, because of this nice thing, dude, I want to buy breakfast this morning. And the first dude was like, absolutely not. That's not how I do it. People don't buy me breakfast. I buy them breakfast. And so now this dude is getting enraged and, like, they're, like, ratcheting it up. And there's this, like, poor little lady sitting, like, across from me. And she's just, like, you know, on the fly, kind of, like, look over, like, what's going on with these guys, you know? And I'm just listening to this thing, like, man. And it's escalating and escalating and escalating. And this guy's like, look, I just want to say thank you. And I wanted to get up and be like, dude, it's $8. Let him pay for it. But I wanted to go over there. I will pay for both of you if we can just settle this down right now. But again, I want to say, dude, just, just receive it, man. He's like, he's trying to show you he's grateful for whatever you did. Just say thanks, dude. Like, I don't, I don't know if it was just, I don't know what was going on but like in that moment, but I know a lot of people are like that, and I know myself have been like that. I've absolutely refused blessing from other people because I didn't want to receive it. I don't know if it was insecurity or pride or, you know, I'm going to be the one that pays or I don't know what it is. But I saw this in my own life because Brittany's parents are very generous. They always like to take us out to eat. And at first, early in our marriage, it didn't feel really awkward, right? Because I'm just like, yeah, I'm just going to, I guess, eat all the meals out and you're going to pay for it. So what I start to do is I start to get really grateful and start being like, I just really appreciate you guys so much. No, I would sneak up to the cash register and I would steal the bill so that I could pay it first. And I thought that was really funny until like the second time I did it and I saw Brittany's dad's face. And I was like, oh, man. Like, I just stole something from him. And not just like a prideful thing. Like, I stole an opportunity to, to be blessed. I stole that from him because this is how he's showing his love to me. And I, my whatever stubbornness, pride, whatever it was, insecurity, I just denied him that by going up and doing this. And the same thing those guys were arguing about. That I've done it before, too. Like, I've been out with guys. I'm like, no, I'm paying, I'm paying. But eventually, though, I'll be like, no, okay, I'll let you pay. Because... I have learned from this guy, Terry Anderson. Terry Anderson taught me this lesson. So Terry Anderson was very successful, is a very successful guy, sold a couple businesses, very wealthy, had a really nice house, and like he and his wife, though, were so ordinary down to earth. Blue jeans, torn up t-shirt, you know, they cut coupons to go to the grocery store, and they were wildly generous with people. So one time, uh, I did something to him, and he paid me way more than he should have paid. And I just, I, like, refused it. I said, no, that's awkward. I can't do that. And he said, can I just take it? Like, I know you guys are young. You're just starting out. Like, just take it. Blah, blah. I'm like, no. And I'm, like, refusing it. I'm making it awkward. I'm a World War III guy now, right? And he's just like, and he cut me off. He's like, Kyle, listen to me. And you know when, like, somebody who admires says that, like, you're a little kid all again, and you're, like, looking up at your dad, like, okay. You know, and I just thought, okay, I'm sorry, Terry. And he said, look. He said, if you deny this, you're denying me a blessing. He said, I know that God's Word promises me what we're talking about this morning, that I'm going to be blessed by God if I take care of you and if I'm just generous this way because I can be. He said, so by you saying no, you're denying me a blessing. And I was just like, all right. You know, and I did, and I took that. So now I kind of have this pattern. Like, yes, I'll say no once, but I understand the value of blessing somebody else through generosity. And now I'm not saying today go out and be like trying to bum money off of people and be like, well, Pastor Kyle said you'll get a blessing. How about 20 bucks? Can I borrow 20 bucks? You know, that's not what I'm talking about. Say no to those people. But I am saying, like, don't deny some of the opportunities to be blessed because they're blessing you. Um, that's a big deal. 13, verse 13. Because of the proof provided by this ministry... They will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. This is an intriguing verse because it's not only a blessing comes, but also that you're going to, this is proof. Next slide. So your generosity is proof of your Christian confession. Not the only proof, but certainly Paul's saying this is evidence of your faith because it's who we are. It's not just a seasonal thing. And if it's just a seasonal thing, maybe we need to let that idea go. 
and he lands the plane by sand, and as they pray on your behalf, they will have deep affection for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Translation, two blessings come. One from God, and one, if you're blessing other Christians, they should be praying blessing on you. I'm curious, if you have somebody that's blessing you, are you playing, praying blessing on them? Because that's, the, that's a culture of generosity. That's what fuels the fire of generosity is when we're praying for each other, when we're looking out for each other, right, in Christian community. Because that's the context for this. It's happening in Christian community. And he's also saying there's deep affection. So there's a deep relationship that will happen there. So generosity is something that just, it just changes things. Because the blessing from God, the blessing from other people, the culture that it creates, the fire that it lights. And he says in verse 15, like to land the plane, he says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. All of this. All of this is set in that context. It's the weight of Christmas. It's the heaven and the hell. It's this, I don't deserve eternity with God, but I get it. Right? Like, I know without God I can't make it to Him. It's, again, it's the weight. That's, there's a weightiness of uh, the Christmas story. And he's saying, because of this, because Kyle Sargent, this broken kid from Mansfield, Ohio, that was messing his life up in every way possible, received an indescribable gift and it changed his life and his eternity. And because of that, I want to make sure that I'm the kind of person that God can use as a conduit to bless other people. As imperfect as I still am, I get to share the joy that we have, that I have, by reflecting the Savior that I belong to. Like, that's, that's what we get to be involved with. So some things I hope we can leave with. One was where I started, that Jesus does expect us to be generous because of how he is with us, because of what he's done in and for us. Number two, being a joyful giver is a choice, but it's also a lifestyle. I hope that you can see that this morning. This is something we're called to all the time, that we need to plan and budget for, both of which, again, share the joy we have by reflecting the Savior that we belong to. And lastly, number three, I want to encourage you to make a sustainable plan. So if this Christmas you're trying to think, how can I be generous? What can I be doing? Pick one or two things. Just one or two things. Maybe it's just making cookies for somebody. It doesn't need to be a big thing, but maybe go and do something for someone a couple of times and then use that as a model to move forward with. Right? Like, all year long, every month, what are you going to do? Well, every time I sit down and do a budget, I'm going to carve out a little bit of money. I'm going to figure out what my budget is, and that's what Brittany and I do. We carve out, we know what we can do, and this is what we're going to be generous with. It allows us to do spon- like spontaneous things. It allows us to be generous in ways that we wouldn't if we weren't paying attention to our money. But we want to have a sustainable plan all year long to be able to bless other people because of how much we've been blessed. Whatever your scale is, figure it out. If it's a little, that's okay. If it's a lot, that's cool too. But just make sure that you're a conduit for God's generosity. Make sure you're a conduit for that, that joy that we have and we get to reflect that in the world because of the Savior that we belong to. That's a beautiful calling that we get to be a part of. And I want to challenge you to it. I want to call you up to it. Because that's what this is about. Amen? All right, let me pray. So, Lord, we thank you so much for today. God, I do thank you. Just, I look at my own life, God, and I have so much better than I deserve in the path that I was on and how you saved me, how you called me out of that, Lord. And I know there's plenty of stories here like that, Lord. And I just ask you, Jesus, to help us to reflect you into the world. Uh, and one of those ways that we can do that, we can show that joy and that hope and that peace, is just to financial generosity, caring for people, caring for other believers, Lord, living differently so that we can give different, Lord. Um, I just hope we all do that well. I hope I do that well. I hope my family continues to do that well, Lord, as well. And I just, I don't know, we keep our eyes on you this Christmas season. Jesus, the, it's a beautiful and powerful and wonderful thing. And I just ask you, Lord, to show us how to just distill everything down, cut out all the noise, Lord, and be able to celebrate what we have in you. And I pray that in your name, Jesus Christ. And church said, Amen. Great seeing you all. I love you. Have a great week.